That was a hell of a review. <laughs> no one has called my book sleek. <laughs> um, this, this is immensely um, uh, exciting and gratifying uh, for me to get to come to this place in particular before this audience and talk about James Merrill. Um, I have a great deal of gratitude uh, to the person who was just speaking and to Stephen Yenser and to everyone who's helped me write this book, which has been a collaborative venture. Um, but uh, the library in particular, uh, I guess, is the indispensable partner um, I've had. Uh, and um, it's very satisfying to, to uh, uh, come here and talk about this book. Um, as Sandy suggested, um, I'm going to talk about this book, uh, and I'm going to, uh, in a sense, try to make some sense of it uh, to myself. Um, I have written um, a paper, a lecture, uh, so I'll warn you about that uh, in advance. Uh, in the car over here, Sandy was complaining about French theory. You'll get a little bit. <coughs> uh, so I'll warn you about that, too. Uh, and enough said. I merely live to work. And that's James Merrill replying to David Calstone. Merrill had been needling him about how slow a writer he was, and Calstone, a professor of literature, defended himself by referring to how little time he had left over after teaching. Some of us have to work for a living. Typical of Merrill to turn a cliche on its head. Typical of him to pack a serious statement into a quip. As his friend pointed out, he had no need to work. The wealth he was born to ensured that. But rather than freeing him from work, his money allowed him to devote himself to the work he wanted to do. It was a kind of work, the writing of poetry, that drew on and shaped the rest of his life, giving meaning and design, a tone and a style to everything he did. Poetry made me who I am. He commented on another occasion, slyly reversing the usual relation between maker and maid. Merrill sounds in these remarks like Oscar Wilde, the subversive master of antithesis, for whom the self was not a natural fact, but material to be fashioned like a work of art. He also sounds like his father, Charles Merrill, who made his fortune working very hard on Wall Street. Indeed, strange to say, Merrill resembled both of these self-made men. He created a version of Wilde's aesthetic lifestyle, uh, updated the, the dandy's role for late 20th century America, and he brought to this project an intensity of industry that his father would have understood. Even if you've uh, only opened it in a bookstore or, or looked inside on Amazon, you will probably recognize that this is the beginning of my biography of James Merrill, those paragraphs. Don't worry. <laughs> I won't keep reading. <clears throat> We'd be here until Monday. It would be like one of those Senate filibusters when uh, a congressman reads the Dallas phone book. Um, I put those paragraphs uh, forward for us because they establish the, the frame for the biography. Uh, they point out not only that Merrill lived the life of a poet, which I, is a specific kind of life, uh, also that he lived it in a particular way. Today, I, I want to take a, a further step back and look at that frame and draw another frame around it. I'll be trying to give definition to those kind of deceptively um, easy-seeming um, terms in, in, in my subtitle, Life and Art. Uh, it will involve, uh, in a sense, uh, asking what kind of book this is. Uh, the answer might seem obvious, a biography. But surely it's a work of criticism, too. So a critical biography, then. But what is that, exactly? Uh, is it a... Uh, uh, a book in which a potentially interesting story is, is periodically interrupted by niggling literary analysis, <clears throat> or maybe a series of close readings of poems nested in an unusually elaborate, not to say 
punishingly long uh, record of a poet's life. <coughs> the New York Times called it punishingly long. Uh, <coughs> the challenge, uh, the challenge of which Merrill was always and acutely aware comes in trying to say what a poet's life and work together add up to. I take him entirely at his word when he says, poetry made me who I am. This is a marvelously condensed statement. What does it mean exactly? It might be helpful to compare it to a principle articulated by Italo Calvino, someone Merrill read and, and met in Paris. Calvino says, the preliminary condition of any work of literature is that the person who is writing has to invent that first character who is the author of the work. The example that Calvino has in mind is Flaubert, Madame Bovary, c'est moi. Yeah, but the Flaubert who wrote Madame Bovary is not the same author cum character who wrote Salambo and Flaubert's other novels. Because, Calvino goes on to say, writing always presupposes the selection of a psychological attitude, a, a rapport with the world, a tone of voice, a homogeneous set of linguistic tools, the date of experience, the phantoms of imagination, in a word, a style. The author is an author insofar as he enters into a role as an actor does. Here, to create an identity through writing is to create a style. Calvino's formula has to do with the novel, uh, a genre founded, really, uh, you could say, on a distinction between author and character. For Merrill, the lyric poet, the situation is somewhat simpler, but for that reason, I think, more complicated with more at stake in the way that there's always more at stake in life than in art. Merrill doesn't get to stand above and to one side of his work like Calvino's Flaubert. The point of view in his poetry is his point of view in life. And the way he lives that life is a subject. We're not talking about an actor entering into a role, but about a man choosing the words he lives by. That's Merrill's phrase. It comes in a comment on Wallace Stevens. In this, Merrill isn't so different from other modern poets, including the impersonal, seemingly non-autobiographical Stevens. What sets him apart, while making him exemplary, is the extent to which he could indeed live to work. Living to or for his work was a risk he could afford financially and psychologically, but still a great risk. Everything was staked on it. Those two categories, life and work, fuse in the work, the name that the Ouija board spirits give to all inspired making, a compound meaning life work through a pun on la vie uh, that's typical of this Frenchified poet. <clears throat> For Merrill, poetics and ethics keep turning into each other. Or we could say that Considered in a system of oppositions whose putatively natural genetic order Merrill's poetry worries and confounds, I mean pairs like cause and effect, reality and projection, source and translation, sign and signified, life and work are, to take another trope from the changing light at Sandover, just one more half-stoned couple doing the chicken and the egg till dawn. How about biography and criticism? Is that another one of those crazy couples? Those two genres are joined at the root of modern literary scholarship in Dr. Johnson's Lives of the English Poets. And for a long time, no one bothered to tell them apart. In the 20th century, however, the higher order thinking called the new criticism defined itself against biography. Biography was exactly what criticism was not. The issue had to do with the work of art's autonomy. For instance, is it a shortcoming that Merrill's poems require, or at least invite, an answer to biographical reading? Is the poetry a lesser thing because biography can seem to make it something more? I've been asked that. The answer depends on how you define aesthetic success. The question expresses the belief that works of art and literature should be evaluated independently of the contextual information in biography. Wimsatt and Beardsley put it memorably in their essay, The Intentional Fallacy. 
in a good poem, all that matters are the words on the page, because everything else has been excluded, like lumps from pudding and bugs from machinery. Merrill's poetry is full of lumps and bugs. Above all, the marvelous nightly pudding, the, the manic machine of Sandover. <clears throat> that this impurity can be a problem shows that, the, uh, that autonomy is, is still a kind of active criterion of evaluation. But autonomy doctrine, this, this ideal, uh, along with so much else in the new criticism, has been rejected, uh, uh, jettisoned by the, uh, the, the kind of historicist uh, um, point of view that, that dominates um, literary criticism today and that emphasizes from one perspective or another the socially embedded nature of all art. This new paradigm for criticism, which has been, in fact, orthodoxy uh, in scholarship for so long, for now more than 30 years, that it isn't very new, uh, it sounds like it might be a good thing for biography, <coughs> but not necessarily so. In fact, literary biography may be even more suspect and outmoded today than it was in the era of the new criticism. The issue has to do with the autonomy of the person rather than the work. From the point of view of contemporary criticism, biography is compromised at its core by its focus on the individual. As a genre, it supports the retrograde view of culture as a parade of exemplary individuals who are overwhelmingly white and male. That's another related issue. <coughs> People are, like texts, a matter of contexts. It's a mistake to see them as the free agents of their destiny. Social structures, transpersonal systems of relation of which they're hardly aware, condition or determine what they do or say. Moreover, we miss the important thing, the social whole, when we gaze for long at any one person. The self was once a great, great glory, J.M. declares trying to sell this idea to his invented nephew, Wendell, early on in Sandover. Oh, sure, but is it still? The sulky teenager shoots back. Wendell is a budding artist in the vein of maybe Francis Bacon. With the perfect confidence of the young, he argues that the representable self, at any rate, ran screaming from the post-impressionist catastrophe, and so on. <clears throat> his sketchbook, portraits capture a vision of mankind as doomed, sick, selfish, dumb as shit that coolly demystifies his uncle's praise for the cultivated self, revealing it as the ideology of privilege. Wendell reasons, they talk about how decent, how refined. All it means is they can afford somehow to watch what's happening and not to mind. Like the huge poem that it comes from, that dialogue was motivated by Merrill's need to respond to the sort of skepticism about personal autonomy that I've been describing. In particular, he had been deeply depressed in 1973 after reading a review of Braving the Elements by Richard Pavier, who argued that Merrill's poetry expressed the worldview of a dying social class. He reacted to this critique as if he were a kind of fraud who'd finally been found out. He wrote in his notebook, Always quick to accept the worst, I quickly fleshed out the skeleton's accusing index finger. What I had scorned and avoided in the world, politics, money, or more exactly, profited by with eyes averted, turned out to have shaped me to its own quite scrutable ends. I was of my time, a gram of the gross national product. The worst Merrill could imagine was to be revealed as a gram of the gross national product. <clears throat> this is a fear about being commodified, co-opted, objectified, precisely in the act of asserting one's subjectivity and creative freedom. We'll return to this fear shortly. In order to understand its force, I want to introduce a, a critic more formidable than Wendell or, or Richard Pavier. I mean, the French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu. This is the French theory part. Oh, yeah. 
it'll be okay, and it won't last too long. Yeah. Uh, Bourdieu, if anyone is, 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 is uh, representative of the kind of historicism I'm describing, uh, his work seems from one angle to demystify the autonomy claimed for modern authors and their works. But I think he's doing something else and something valuable for me as I think about Merrill. He urges us to recognize autonomy as, in a sense, both real and not given. <clears throat> Rather, he calls it uh, a position to be made. He, he's talking about, about creating this ideal of uh, autonomy uh, in the course of um, uh, uh, creating literature itself as a, as a, as a general field uh, of uh, production, uh, a field that Bourdieu refers to as the economic world reversed. Reversed because it's characterized by, and now I'll quote him, systematic inversion of the fundamental principles of all ordinary economies, that of business, it excludes the pursuit of profit, that of power, it condemns honors and temporal greatness, and even that of institutionalized cultural authority. The absence of any academic training or consecration may be considered a virtue. <clears throat> the field consists in points or positions that correspond to uh, the aesthetic choices of individuals and groups affected by the, the push and pull of institutions and other agencies. In the inverted logic that governs here, those positions that are farthest removed from economic and political power have the highest prestige because they're the most disinterested and therefore the most dedicated to art or literature itself. Uh, Bourdieu's a, a account of the, the genesis of the literary field centers on the emergence of aestheticism in 19th century France. He describes two signal inventions. The first is, I'm quoting him again, that unprecedented social personage, the modern writer or artist, a full-time professional dedicated to his work in a total and exclusive manner, indifferent to the exigencies of politics and to the injunctions of morality, and not recognizing any jurisdiction other than the norms specific to one's art. The second invention is the lifestyle of that writer or artist, an art of living defined by those who live by art and its dictates rather than those of society at large and who form the restricted market in which their work is produced and received. Bohemia is the location of this new society within society whose standard bearers for Bourdieu are Baudelaire, the Parnassians, the symbolists, particularly Mallarmé, Flaubert in fiction, and then ultimately Proust. Uh, of course, uh, the modern writer and the aesthetic lifestyle are not somehow uh, merely parallel or coincident developments, they rather create uh, and sustain each other. Uh, Bourdieu puts it this way in a, in a formulation that's, that's very close to the one from Calvino that I started with. Proust, the writer, is what the narrator becomes in and through the work that produces the recherche and that produces him as a writer. How would Merrill react to Bourdieu? I bet by rolling his eyes. <coughs> raising an eyebrow, or simply falling asleep. He would have hated the sociologist's style in particular. But his ideas? I think he'd have to admit to understanding them intimately on the basis of his own biography. The economic world was not a sociological abstraction. It was daddy. Merrill's literary vocation would set him apart from his father and the businessman's whole way of life that effect points to a motive. Merrill became a poet on one level specifically to distinguish himself from his famous father, to make his own name, and in that way to compete with him, but on grounds of his choosing, and not openly. The threat to the son's autonomy posed by this dynastic father, with Charlie Merrill's entourage of lovers and hangers-on, was considerable. How easy it would have been for Merrill never to become something more than one of the old man's possessions, a line on the balance sheet or a gram in the gross national product. Even if Merrill could see that his path to freedom and self-expression required the money that his father gave him. Bourdieu quotes Gautier grumbling uh, to the farceur Fado, Flaubert was smarter than us. He had the wit to come into the world with money something that is indispensable for anyone who wants to get anywhere in art. <clears throat>
How many of Merrill's friends and enemies said the same thing behind his back? Meanwhile, Merrill had always identified with Mama. Helen Merrill, the muse who copied and preserved the boy's first poem, looking at mummy. The identification deepened with his parents' divorce, in which he saw his mother as the injured party. Literature and art, in contrast to the masculine domains of business and politics, were already marked as feminine. Choosing them implied a rejection of masculine norms, which were tainted in the young boy's eyes by the abuse of power, it being natural, he had concluded from his father's behavior, for power to be abused. Bourdieu refers to writers and artists wryly as the dominated fraction of the dominant class. <clears throat> Maybe Jimmy saw his mother, and by extension his young self, in somewhat similar terms. In any case, some kind of allegory isn't very far away from Merrill's mature poetic thought. Commenting on the poem about his parents' divorce, the broken home, where at one point his parents turn into Father Time and Mother Earth, he said once, you don't see eternity except in the grain of sand, or history except at the family dinner table. Merrill would hardly be the artist he was, however, if his positioning of himself in the world came down simply to taking his mother's side against his father. Here the issue of lifestyle is crucial. Choosing literature and art as a way of life entailed for Merrill not only uh, a structure of, of gender identification, but a particular sexual disposition. In a way, poetry and homosexuality were for him the same choice. Think of Merrill's first sexual relationship, which grew out of a private poetry tutorial. I shall write, be brilliant, be great, he wrote in his diary the day that he met Keeman Fryer. Then a month later, we are in love, Keeman and I, tenderly, passionately, completely. But homosexuality, which set Merrill apart from his father even more than his poetry did, divided him also and more painfully from his mother. No less essential to his being than poetry was, it confirmed the depth of his dedication to art, his singularity, and made his vocation a matter of his whole life. As he quips in the broken home, Merrill obeyed both his parents, but inversely. The pun identifies him as at once an invert and a poet, and roots both of these identities in his ambivalent relation to his parents. The broken home creates a, a personal autobiographical myth to explain the origins of that compound identity. In the sort of paradox that he trained himself to savor, Merrill's singularity as a person and an artist derived from his commitment to doubleness, which was expressed in his ability to see both sides of any issue, not to mention every possible pun. This uh, labile perspective uh, uh, this kind of mobile perspective was the basis for a philosophical stance and a literary style. Uh, you could say a, a philosophy uh, embedded in a style. <clears throat> uh, it is the achieved form of the autonomy that was thrust upon Jimmy as the child of the broken home, where he discovered himself as a third term, simultaneously in between and neither nor. The mirror that became his chosen emblem, his answer to the family crests that his parents concocted, the mirror showed the self as double and inverted. It's a fit symbol for the tautological program of art for art's sake and for a life dedicated to literature in the economic world reversed. Let me try to position Merrill now very quickly in the, in the context of, of post-war American poetry. Um, to try to work out how his particular uh, um, pursuit of what I'm calling autonomy uh, 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 worked in this, in this particular field. To begin with, I should point out that although he worked in several genres, and in that sense tried on several authorial roles, he was always primarily a poet. In this sense, he wasn't exploring alternatives to poetry, but really testing how far poetry might be extended. His plays, inspired by the likes of Metterlink, and his novels, modeled respectively on 
late Henry James and the Nouveau Roman never had a chance of commercial success. <clears throat> and to that extent, uh, they were evidently the works of a poet, and a rarefied poet at that. The immortal husband and, and the seraglio came before the public against his protests with blurbs by Tennessee Williams and Truman Capote. Celebrity writers, and not incidentally homosexuals, whom Mer Merrill knew but didn't particularly like, being turned off by their showy personal styles aimed at Broadway and Hollywood. He was a snob in relation to their snobbery. Curiously, because he was almost alone, I think, in this among Americans of his generation, Merrill's early formative literary identifications were with decadent pre-modernist French writers and artists, including especially musicians and composers, who were key figures in uh, Bourdieu's phrase, the conquest of autonomy. Merrill used those unlikely models, and then writers like Wilde and Eleanor Wiley, whom he read in their light, uh, used them to create for himself a florid aestheticism that was alien and anachronistic in the context of his era. Post-war American poetry was a matter of self-consciously innovative and competing movements and schools. The Beats, Black Mountain, confessional poetry, the New York School, and so on. Merrill pointedly belonged to none of these groups. He saw their ways of writing as rhetorical choices, and in that sense, ideologies, rather than what they claimed to be, historical, political, aesthetic, or even, in the case of Allen Ginsberg's breath units, biological imperatives. As he put it in 1967, with almost aggressive languor, anybody starting to write today has at least 10 kinds of poems, each different from the other, on which to pattern his own. Merrill's move, setting him above the fray and by himself, was to present his own style precisely as a style validated by nothing more or less than his preference. Uh, here, I think of Wallace Stevens. We like poetry because we do. <clears throat> by this means, Merrill maintained his independence not only from post-war poetry's various schools, but from the school itself, the academy, where so many poets of his generation would from now on be employed as teachers of literature and or creative writing. It's hard to reflect on or, or even register the, this development in literary culture. Uh, we're still so uh, deeply uh, inside its unfolding consequences. Uh, Mark McGurl, uh, a uh, scholar of um, American literature, names the, the post-war period in, in American fiction the program era. <clears throat> uh, referring to the rise of MFA programs and their effect on the novel and short story. That label works even better for poetry, which, lacking fiction's potential access, however selective, to a large market and real money, was from early on more dependent <clears throat> on sponsorship by colleges and universities. The mid-century American English department is, in one sense, the final stage of the elaboration of aestheticism. It was an institution devoted to poetry as poetry, as the new critics, many of them poets, like to say. But the academy accommodated poetry only on the condition of professionalization. The art of living, which had evolved outside and indeed in opposition to existing institutions, now submitted to the standard expectations of bureaucratic appointments. <coughs> CVs. <coughs> interviews, conferences. <clears throat> it's in this context that Merrill's determined, sometimes defiant dilettantism takes on its full meaning. To be sure, Merrill's poetic sensibility was a product of the classroom, Amherst's. And he himself taught in colleges, Bard, Amherst, Wisconsin, Yale, here at Washington University. But these were temporary, entirely optional, and in a sense, experimental situations from which, like his love affairs, his money ensured that he could pull back and go elsewhere. He cultivated academic friends and they served his poetry, uh, served it very well, but he was a guest in their world. 
and he was surprisingly uncomfortable when called upon to behave as they did, as, for instance, when writing critical prose. He published only one book of it, entitled Recitative, to make it clear that he wasn't singing. Sandy, who edited the volume for a small press, uh, explained to me he was fine about having his essays collected and published so long as someone else did it for him. And he didn't want to be published by Knopf or Athenaeum like the rest of his, his, his books. It was outside the canon of his work. On a copy inscribed for Peter Hooten, Merrill wrote, we amateurs, as Peter knows, have very little use for prose. Prose was for the prose, poetry for amateurs. The pose of the amateur, however, was just that, a pose. Merrill used it in the midst of poetry's own program era to reclaim the heroic role of the modern writer or artist as defined by Bourdieu. In Merrill's calculated dilettantism, the full-time professional devoted to his work in a total and exclusive manner is rescued by the amateur from the professionalism of the academy. As I, as I said, Bourdieu speaks of writers occupying specific points in the literary field. The point that Merrill occupied can be specified exactly. 107 Water Street, Stonington, Connecticut, the poet's primary residence from 1954 until his death. The spot was sufficiently far from other centers of influence that Merrill could create his own miniature society there. Uh, but not the same thing as the society within a society uh, called Bohemia or Greenwich Village where other writers and artists live. On the third floor of a stiff, unlovely commercial building, hidden by sheer ordinariness, Merrill and David Jackson set up their queer McCarthy-era lair. I could go on for pages. In my book, I do go on, uh, describing the place. What I want to emphasize is that the Water Street apartment is the materialization of what I'm calling Merrill's autonomy. A whole aesthetic, its internal literary properties and external social relationships can be read out of it. Here, Merrill's life and work commingle, each created in the image of the other. In the 25th reunion guide to the Lawrenceville class of 1943, Merrill lists his home and work addresses as the same. In a book full of lawyers and Wall Street executives, he's the one for whom work and home are one, for whom that fundamental everyday schism doesn't obtain. But in fact, Merrill doesn't simply work at home as we telecommuters say today. Again, uh, the Water Street apartment illustrates the complication. Merrill's study is disguised by a bookshelf on the door to it, which swings open to a room inside the apartment's other room, an inner room, to invoke the title of his next to last book. Like other spaces Merrill worked in, in Athens and Key West, this is a semi-secret place designed for private meditation, an anchorite's cell. It removes the writer from the world, the world of the house, and then the world beyond that, of which the room still remains part. There's just one window one might look out of if the desk weren't turned away from it. Books fill the shelves, rise in stacks from the floor. Words, words, words. This is the space scaled to one person, like a coffin or a closet, in which we must imagine the activity of the full-time professional devoted to his work in a total and exclusive manner or in Merrill's own language, a man choosing the words he lives by. The life of the poet as Merrill lived it is ultimately the story of what happened at his desk. The principle of autonomy involved for Merrill a discipline of reflexivity, of self-scrutiny, more than self-expression, which was enacted through a compositional process of painstaking revision. His desk, his notebook, these were mirrors. Critics call an urban convalescence a pivotal poem in Merrill's career. The poem, placed first in Water Street, it's Merrill's third book from 1962, ends with the resolution to make some kind of house out of the life lived, out of the love spent. <clears throat> 
And I'm just, just seeing grammatically now that life and love are, are uh, parallel nouns. And love is something spent like cash. In these terms, teasingly literal and figurative at once, the poem lays out a future plan for Merrill's life and work, which will go on to have, both his life and work, so much to do with his home. The pivot in this pivotal poem comes right in the middle of it. Outside on a city street, still weak from an unspecified illness, Merrill pretends that his tears come from the cold day. Then he stops and scolds himself with cold, all right then, with self-knowledge. Then he goes on, moving indoors to his desk and from free verse into rhymed quatrains, while pushing toward that resonant conclusion that I just quoted. The pivot is the question with cold. In his drafts of the poem, he saved 46 worksheets. That question appears in pen as a marginal note beside the phrase, eyes a stream with cold where he'd been stuck for some time. This is a case of Merrill integrating self-interrogation, arrived at in the process of revision, within the poem itself, and finding in this action the impetus to continue. It would be hard to say definitively whether with cold was a skeptical question that Merrill put to himself while going over the draft, and in that sense a real question, or whether it was the simulation of one an imitation of a man choosing words. But we don't really need to settle it. For the point is, uh, at his desk, he was, you could say, dissolving the difference between performance and reality. From a notebook, a gorgeous lyric about the experience of writing in a notebook directly follows an urban convalescence in Water Street as a gloss on that longer, uh, self-consciously important and programmatic poem, the shorter one says that Merrill will make some kind of house out of his life using his notebook. That the project comes down to the work of composition, which begins with the breaking of new ground, clean pages, fresh snow, and then the daily activity of going over it again in revision. The poem puns, as Stevens also liked to, on the Latin root of candor, meaning both honesty and the white page that invites it. From this point forward in his career, all of Merrill's poetry might as well bear the caption from a notebook. His writing would increasingly foreground the process that produced it, understood as the conversion of life into art by means of such reliable pre-digital implements as paper, pen, and ink. Merrill was well prepared then to receive the letter from Mona Van Dyne in 1964 that invited him to think of Washington University as home base for his papers. Uh, incidentally, in my book, I say this letter doesn't survive. Nonsense. Uh, you can see it in the library uh, in the uh, exhibit that, that Joel has, has created. It's the only mistake. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't think we can exaggerate the importance of the library's invitation and Merrill's apparently immediate decision to accept it. I think, incidentally, this notion it was a very, very important that came from, well, there's a lot of conditions that, that determined it, but I think he particularly liked the notion of a home for his writing. Uh, it satisfied his wish to waste nothing and relatedly, as I say in the book, to turn his whole life to account. There's no question that the existence of the archive by reinforcing his interest in the writing process and affirming its value, shaped how Merrill thought of his writing as well as how he wrote. In many, he was not only producing writing for publication, but producing a record of that process contextualized by notebooks, guest books, letters, other documents, not to mention clippings, photos, all sorts of semi-random realia. The whole is what matters here insofar as the inevitably fragmentary record constituted by a personal archive can be said to represent a whole. In a sense, the place where we find Merrill's life and work most deeply embedded in each other, uh, the place to, to look for what I'm calling his autonomy, isn't, in fact, his apartment in Stonington, but special collections here in St. Louis. The Merrill papers are the product of a quite specific moment in cultural history. First, 
there had to be in place the belief that a modern writer's papers could be of permanent value and interest. Libraries were not busy collecting Pound and Elliot, uh, even 30 years before uh, Van Dyne wrote to Merrill. Uh, we can go back to Bourdieu's notion of the modern writer as a full-time professional uh, dedicated to his work in this total and exclusive manner. It's this personage, still reasonably new to the world, and uh, uh, who creates the materials that libraries want to collect. And obviously, there must be libraries, like Olin, with sufficient funds and, uh, and institutional ambition to go out and recruit, to bet on, Writers who, uh, at this point in their lives, James Merrill, Robert Creeley, in their mid-30s, had really not done a lot more than establish their promise. The condition for that bet is, again, the rise of the modern English department and the university study of literature, which confirm the value of authors and their archives, even if getting research scholars and their classes into special collections wasn't the first thing that an archivist was trained to do. And, paradoxically, the new criticism was busy insisting that biography, and for that matter, worksheets and notebooks were more or less beside the point. <clears throat> Finally, there had to be paper. Bourdieu's full-time professional, Merrill's man choosing the words he lives by, and for that matter, the Washington University Collection of Modern Literature, all of these would be unthinkable in the particular form I'm describing them without the way that paper records literary process, sensitizes writers and readers to the materiality of words, and establishes a symbolic equivalence between authors and their works, an equivalence rooted in the simple physical presence of both the person and the book, as they are attached from the first moment of composition when the hand puts pen to paper and makes a personal mark. As Merrill realized near the end of his career, he had lived the life of the poet in the radiant twilight of the era of the book. Merrill created an image of that life in its heroic form in another poem from Water Street for Proust. Merrill's Proust goes out into the social world, then returns home up the straight stair where, uh, in a dim room without contour, the space of Proust's achieved autonomy, what happened is becoming literature. The progressive present tense there is becoming, evokes an ongoing process in which, which the, the passive voice uh, disguises the agent in that, in that process. In the end, as Merrill puts it in the poem's last line, describing dawn, the world will have put on a thin gold mask. There's much to say about that sentence. I'll make just two points. First. If we read it not simply as a reference to sunrise, but as a statement about what's left when what happened has become literature, then the end of writing, the goal of it, is to change how the world looks by setting it in a new light. Second, writing accomplishes this by magic, of which we have to be skeptical. There's a reason writing takes place in private or behind a curtain. The emblem of the transformation is a thin gold mask. Merrill might be referring to a funerary treasure like the death mask of Agamemnon excavated at Mycenae, as Stephen has suggested. But as an image of, of sunrise, that mask is nothing more substantial or permanent than an effect of the light due to change again in a moment. The world has been transformed, and yet not, or only in a way. The claim is simultaneously very grand and very fragile. In this, it's typical of Merrill. So is the mention of gold. There are references to gold throughout Merrill's writing, as there are to alchemy, which is the model for literature's magic in For Proust. In Farewell Performance, a much later poem, Merrill chooses alchemy as the metaphor for aesthetic transformation generally. Limber alembics, meaning the body of the dancers, on the stage of the New York City Ballet, once more make of the common lot a brief, pure, brief gold. Note, again, the brevity, the sad fragility of the effect. The poem is, is followed in the inner room, the volume where we find it, by the last poem in the book, which is called Processional, 
Here the topic is specifically the transformative powers of language and by implication poetry. Merrill, dedicated lover of games and word games in particular, wins here when in three lucky strokes of word golf, lead, L-E-A-D, once again turns load, goad, to gold. This is the kind of thing Merrill does in his notebooks constantly, uh, play this kind of game with anagrams or word golf. Merrill wrote Processional, his notebooks show us, when he just completed The Changing Light at Sandover and had not yet settled on its title. That little poem, Processional, sonnet, I think, is a radically condensed version of the long poem. It's an example of Merrill playing with words as he did on the Ouija board and in his notebooks. What he's looking for in a game of word golf, which is a, a pastime he found in Lolita, <coughs> is the same thing that he went to the spirits for. The moment when letters would realign in a new shape and words might reveal, as if of their own intention, an unsuspected but hoped for message. Meaning, where before there had only been raw linguistic material or the dead fact of the already said. That was the gold Merrill played for. The metaphor obsessed him because it was a, a way to understand his relationship to his father and behind them both, the relationship between aesthetics and the economic world. Merrill, of course, never renounced his father's money. He understood very well that even as it compromised his autonomy, his autonomy was based on it. The trick, therefore, and it could only be a trick, would be to transform rather than renounce his father's gold. Until he made it something else, it was merely lead. The gold of literature redeemed like a dividend, the gold required to produce it. At the same time, the gold Merrill made was figurative, an effect of the light. It was, like Merrill's style, dependent for its value on his faith in it, and therefore on his willingness, like Keats or Stevens, to suspend disbelief and believe in a fiction. To believe in fiction itself, we could say. Bourdieu ends uh, the field of cultural production, the, key essay I've been quoting a lot from by quoting Mallarmé. Mallarmé says, I venerate how, by a trick, we project to a forbidden height and with thunder, the conscious lack in us of what shines up there. What is it for? A game. The idea that the pursuit of beauty is a game in which the writer is himself the source of the ideal he seeks, projecting it on high in another world above him, this would be very familiar to Merrill. Thus it was on the Ouija board. Thus it was, sometimes, with the many loved. But the aesthetic game is no less dignified or dangerous once it is recognized as one. For the one who plays, a life is at stake. I understand my book as the story of the way Merrill played that game. Adventure, experiment, those words capture the subject too, but without some of the ambiguous connotations of game. But the, 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 really, the uncertain status of a game is what's important here. As with the Ouija board itself, Merrill was interested in the possibility of elevating play to the level of the highest seriousness. And in his continual drive to write, to wrest meaning from language and experience, we can feel the pressure of his fear of disillusionment, of being exposed as a fraud, a mountebank, an alchemist, who's only playing with words. <clears throat> All of you who, who are familiar with Merrill's work uh, will have recognized the, the source of my title for this lecture, The Biographical Container. It comes from his memoir, A Different Person, when his mother, Helen Plummer, is making final arrangements for herself, means to request a biodegradable burial, and ends up saying something else. <clears throat> at, at one point, I saw this lecture uh, uh, on the website advertised as the biological container. <laughs> That's funny because it's exactly wrong. Uh, the biographical container is, as Merrill adapted his mother's malapropism, the verbal paper record of a life transformed by writing. It's what all of Merrill's writing amounts to displayed on a shelf 
It's what, in a sense, the Merrill papers and special collections are. And of course, that's what my biography of Merrill is. Let me just wind up by returning to that question I raised about the relationship between criticism and biography. Merrill gives us a life that can, must, be read as we read a poem, because this is what he himself did to his life by writing about it in the way that he did. Conversely, his poems emerging from his life and reflecting on it are events in that life, essential features of the story, and what, as he told David Carlstone, he was living for. In this case, I think criticism and biography are just the same thing. So, thank you. <laughs>